In today's lesson, we will be continuing our look at factors that affect population growth by zoning in on migration. While countries are fundamentally impacted by their natural increases, birth and death rates, migration also has a large impact on whether or not a population is growing or shrinking. So in this lesson, we'll be doing a general overview of some of the issues surrounding migration. We will start by establishing some definitions for basic terms that we will be using throughout the lesson, as well as looking at some metrics for analyzing migration. Second, we will examine some of the causes of migration by looking at push and pull factors. Third, we will explore some general characteristics of migrants. Fourth, we will look at some potential barriers to migration. And finally, we will try to understand the long-term impacts of migration on a particular place. Now, while it's common for us to think of immigration as a modern concept, in a modern context, uh, it's a phenomenon that's been ongoing for literally all of human history. If we look back to the earliest humans, um, when Homo sapiens first emerged about a million years ago, um, they started on the continent of Africa. Um, but as this map shows us here, we can trace the movement of human populations over the millennia. So our distant ancestors began to migrate out of Africa about 100,000 years ago. Um, so first up into the Middle East, what we would know as the Middle East today, um, and then throughout Asia, and then from there on to other continents. Um, and modern genetics is what helps us understand and confirm this theory. So we can study DNA mutations um, throughout different ethnic groups in order to trace these migration patterns. And with our current understanding of genetics, we can have a pretty good guess of what these migration patterns look like. And that's exactly what this map here is showing. Now, although migration might look different at different points in time, there's many commonalities that we'll find from period to period. So those earliest humans, 100,000 years ago, may have been migrating to places with better resources, better food sources, better climates, or we could look to other groups throughout history. So for example, the pilgrims um, who came from Europe to the Americas, one of the first groups to settle, uh, European groups to settle in North America, who came to America um, due to political and religious tensions at home. They came to America to practice a particular Puritan uh, strand of, the, of their religion. Or here, where we have Pier 21 in Halifax, um, sort of the Canadian version of Ellis Island in the, in the United States. Um, so this picture here is from the late 1940s. Um, following World War II, many Europeans uh, fleeing the continent, migrating out to North America and coming to Canada. Um, in order to escape the aftermath of World War II. Again, their countries had been devastated by war, their economies had been devastated, cities destroyed. Um, coming to Canada, these people, um, looking for a better life, looking for better job opportunities. And again, these, even though the context might be different, um, we're going to see a lot of these themes come up throughout different migrant groups. There's a lot of commonalities, even if the times are different and the people coming are different. So to start off here, we want to establish some key terms and definitions that we're going to be using going forward. So when we talk about migration, it is simply the movement of people across a specified boundary for the purpose of establishing a new residence. And this last part's important here. It's you're establishing a new residence. You're leaving one place and you're permanently moving to another place. And then from migration, we have two distinct groups or actions that can be taken. So we have an immigrant who is a person who moves into a new country, as opposed to an emigrant, one who moves out of a country. Now, it's important to remember that when someone's moving from one country to another, they're both an immigrant and emigrant at the same time. They're an immigrant to their new country, and they're an emigrant from their former country. And in order to measure these trends and patterns, there are some basic metrics that we want to use. 
So first of all is immigration rate, which is simply the number of people immigrating to a country per thousand people. And then on the flip side to that, we have emigration rate, which is the number of people leaving a country per thousand. And then by using these two statistics, we can calculate net migration, which is simply immigration rate minus emigration rate. And this is telling us the total number of people um, in the aggregate who are coming into a country or leaving. And once we have this statistic, once we know what the net migration is, we can use this along with the natural increase to calculate what the total population change is. These are the only two ways that a country can change its population. It's either people who are naturally increasing the population or through migration. So by adding these two numbers together, we can calculate total growth. Now, why move in the first place? It's a question that, you know, might not be as easy to answer as it might seem on first glance. As anyone who's ever moved knows, moving is a real pain. You have to pack and unpack. You have to carry lots of stuff. You have to get used to new places and new people. And this is just the kind of stuff that you have to deal with if you're moving 10 minutes away from your house. Never mind if you're moving to a new country. It's just that much harder. So you have to ask yourself, why would someone go to all the trouble of moving to a new country? Uh, so in order to do this, we have to look at some of the reasons that might drive one to migrate to a new country. And so we can do this by, look, by dividing these reasons into two basic categories, push factors and pull factors. So push factors are reasons that cause you to leave a place either because of war, because the economy's bad, because there's a lack of human rights, because there's a lack of quality education, or for a variety of other reasons. These are things that make you not like the place you're staying in right now and make you want to find somewhere better to live. On the flip side, we have pull factors. These are the reasons that attract you to a new place. So things like joining relatives who live somewhere else, a better climate for job opportunities, because there's cheap land to be had, or for a variety of other factors. Now, when one is deciding to migrate, they might be influenced by both push factors and pull factors at the same time. There may be things that are pushing them out of their current location, while at the same time they're being pulled to another. For example, someone who's living in a war-torn nation might be influenced by the fact that their relatives live in a more peaceful part of the world and might want to move in with those people. And at the same time, there could be multiple push factors that push one out of a country and multiple pull factors that pull one towards a new country. And so to look at this in a little more detail, um, we can look at examples of pull factors and push factors. So to begin with, we'll look at a historical example of pull factors by looking at the expansion of the West in Canada. So what this graph here is showing is immigration rates in Canada throughout its history. And as you can see, it's not been consistent. There have been periods of very high immigration and periods of very low immigration and everywhere in between. There's ebbs and flows to this graph. Um, now the periods of low immigration they tend to be times when pull factors aren't as strong. So, for example, when there's a recession, uh, you can see here in, from about 1930 to 1950, um, the economy is not very good. The Great Depression is underway. So you're not going to have many people coming to Canada because there's a lack of job opportunities. At the same time, in the uh, during the 70s and the late 80s, early 90s, Canada was going through a recession. Um, there would be less of a reason or an incentive for people to want to migrate to Canada um, because there would, might not be a job for them when they get there. At other times, there might not be as much immigration because of barriers to travel. So, for example, during World Wars I and II, we see a dramatic drop-off in the amount of people immigrating to Canada. And World War II in particular, as it's coming on the heels of the Great Depression. On the flip side, times of highest immigration, um, they tend to be times when there are many factors that are pulling immigrants into the country. So the highest point of immigration on this chart here 
uh, is in the early 1900s, during the expansion of the West. So in 1905, the Canadian government established two new provinces, Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, they were created out of land that was formerly part of the Northwest Territories. And this was an area that had been sparsely populated by indigenous people. Um, and there were fears that the American government might want to expand into that region. They had expanded from coast to coast um, throughout what we now know as the continental U.S., but because of the idea of manifest destiny, there were many in Canada who were worried that Americans might try to uh, continue this expansion into Canadian territory. So one way of dealing with this would be to set up um, larger settlements in the West. And this would also help link Canada, as British Columbia was fairly isolated from the rest of Canada at this point. So in order to do this, um, they weren't going to take people who already lived in Canada and relocate them. The idea was to attract settlers from Europe to establish in the region. Um, and this was the idea of, of, of bringing people in and creating this coast-to-coast uh, -coast Canada from east to west. And so this man at the bottom of, uh, with the picture at the bottom here, this is Clifford Sifton, who was the Minister of the Interior under Wilfrid Laurier. And under Laurier, there was something called an open-door immigration policy. Um, and this is what they were using to bring in immigrants. Now, despite the name, it really wasn't an open door. They weren't attracting just anybody into Canada. Um, in practice, this was mostly people from Eastern Europe that they were going after. Now, one thing that we want to keep in mind here when we're looking at changes in immigration, um, at this time, people from Eastern Europe would not have been considered, quote unquote, white. Race is something which is, in, which is very context dependent. It's a social construct. Uh, and in the early 1900s, essentially, if you were not British or of French descent, you weren't considered white. So if you were of Italian descent or Greek descent, or Hungarian descent, or even Irish descent, um, you would not have been seen as white in the eyes of many. So this idea of immigration and immigrants being the other um, has always been around in Canada. Now, how were these people going to be attracted to Canada? Well, at the time, there's no internet. There's no way of advertising to people um, in that way. So posters would have been a common way to attract people and to advertise. And these posters here are advertising a few things in particular. Um, the biggest attraction that they're, that they're uh, advertising is free land for the settlers. So they promise good land, free passage to the New World, good money, freedom. Um, on this poster here on the left, you can see the image of the bird flying freely over the farmland. It's supposed to represent, you know, the freedom that you would have settling the new frontier. Um, but there's a bit of a disconnect, obviously, from the reality, as anyone who's ever been uh, lived through a winter in Western Canada can attest to, uh, it's not nice and sunny and warm throughout the year. In fact, most of the year is cold and dreary and snowy and full of bugs. Uh, but that's obviously not what they're advertising. They want to make this place look as nice as possible to attract the most immigrants that they can. And although immigration rates have changed over time, its importance to Canadian population growth is increasing. So this graph here is showing uh, birth rates and versus immigration rates over Canada's history. And we can see here that the two are converging uh, into the 21st century. Birth rates are on the decline, while at the same time immigration rates are increasing. And if this pattern continues, one day we might see immigration rates overtake birth rates. Um, and that's important because without a positive net migration, Canada's growth rate would be very slow or even stagnant. Um, and there are certain issues that would come along with that. So what we see from this is that Canada remains an attractive destination for immigrants today, even though the sources of those immigration are changing over time. On the other hand, we could look at push factors and historical examples of those. And one really great example is the Irish potato famine. So the Irish potato famine affected Ireland from 1845 to 1852. And during this time, uh, about two-fifths of the population relied on potatoes to survive. 
However, the potato crop was infected by a disease called potato blight, um, wiping out crops across the country. Uh, and as a result, this caused death, starvation, disease, and as a result, these were factors pushing people to emigrate away, those that could survive. And as a result, the population shrunk by about 25% in a short period of time, and it's really never recovered. So this graph here is showing that while the rest of Europe has seen significant growth in the past 200 years, uh, even though that growth rate has plateaued in the last few decades, um, Ireland's population is still below where it was, below the potato famine. It's made a bit of a recovery post-World War II, but the sheer numbers, they've never really recovered. Now that we know what causes one to migrate, let's look at some of the characteristics of migrants. So on average, migrants tend to be more educated than the average person in their origin country. They tend to be white-collar workers and military personnel. They represent a large percentage of immigrants, um, people moving around for business, or military personnel who might be stationed at different places around the world. Another factor which increases one's likelihood of moving are major life events, things like marriage, divorce, graduation, births, and deaths. These kind of life transitions might, uh, might make one choose to move to a new country. And most migrants tend to be between the ages of 18 and 30. Again, this is a point in one's life where they're not necessarily tied down to a location, where moving to a new place and looking for new job opportunities, for example, this is a time where you don't have a career necessarily established. We might not have a family that you're tied to. Um, so it makes it easier for one to move when they're at these ages. Short distances are more common than long distances. People are more likely to move to their neighboring country than they are halfway around the world. Just as one's more likely to move to another place within their own city or within their own province than they are to move somewhere on the other side of the country. And migration flows can be either permanent or temporary. Now, one thing we want to make clear here is that someone who commutes to work every day is not a migrant, even if that's a far commute, even if you're driving for hours and hours to work because you're still returning home at night. However, a seasonal farmer would be considered a migrant. Someone who, for example, is coming from Mexico to work on a strawberry farm in California for the summer months. Uh, they are a migrant because they are living in that new location, even if they plan to return at a later date. And we can see examples of these circular migration patterns. So circular migrants are seasonal migrants based on circular, short-term, repetitive patterns. So one example of this might be snowbirds. So older people from Canada who live in Florida during the winter months, but then come back to Canada during the summer. Another example of circular migrants would be that many of the European migrants who came to the U.S. through Ellis Island in New York in the early parts of the 20th century, it's estimated that about one third of them returned to their home countries eventually. So we can see here, migration is not always permanent. Even if people are living in their country for decades, they might eventually want to return home to their home country. Another group of migrants that's important to look at are temporary labor migrants. So they're also known as guest workers. And this is common in many places throughout the world, but one place where it's very important to the local economies is in the Middle East. Um, so in some places, so for example, this graph at the side here is showing you uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. Um, in some of these countries, guest workers make up the majority of the labor force. You can see in Qatar here, uh, at one point in the 80s, over 90% of their workforce were foreign workers, were these guest workers. Um, and this, in some cases, contributes to xenophobia in the region. And we see this right now in the U.S. presidential election with some of the rhetoric surrounding Mexican migrants in the U.S., the idea of they're coming here to take our jobs, um, they're taking good jobs away from the locals, which is not usually the case. Usually these migrants are taking jobs that other people are unwilling to do, either because that work is dangerous or that work is low-paying 
or that work is seen as below them. Usually these migrants are filling a role in the economy that otherwise would not have been filled. And so this is very common in the Middle East today, um, especially in the oil industry. And again, these are jobs that tend to be very dangerous. They tend to be very unskilled. They tend to be low paying. Um, and they probably would not be filled as easily by people who are native to these countries. So one example of this is for the 2022 World Cup that's being uh, planned for Qatar. Um, a lot of the work being done on the stadiums is being done by guest workers, people from Nepal and India and Bangladesh in particular. And then um, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding the use of Nepali workers in particular. It's hard to get exact numbers, um, but it's often been cited that um, at least 1,200 people have died building these stadiums to date, and that that number is actually probably higher. Um, because again, it's very hard to get exact statistics. And that, uh, by some estimates, upwards of 4,000 people may have been killed building these stadiums by the time the World Cup happens in 2022. Now, migration is not always easy. There are many barriers to migration. So one definition we want to establish is that there can be intervening obstacles. So these are barriers to migration. So they could be things like immigration laws, the cost of moving, not knowing anyone in the country. These are things that might prevent one from being able to move. And these barriers can be either physical or political. Physical barriers are characteristics of physical geography that prevent immigration. So these are things like oceans or rivers or mountains that separate you physically from the place that you want to go to. And this is usually more of an issue for refugees or undocumented migrants. So for example, here we see Cuban migrants who are attempting to reach Florida on a makeshift raft out of, made out of a pickup truck. Um, or the immigrants coming from, or refugees coming from the Middle East and North Africa across the Mediterranean on rafts. Um, these are people facing physical barriers to their migration. On the other hand, there are many political barriers. And these are going to vary from country to country. So it may depend on the needs of the country or where immigrants are coming from. So for example, in Canada, we use a point system to determine whether or not someone is worthy of immigrating to our country. And if you don't qualify under that point system, let's say you don't have the right education or the right skills, um, you might be denied entry. On the other hand, we could have political opposition. So for example, again, the rhetoric and opposition to Mexican immigration in the United States might prevent many Mexicans from legally entering the country, even though they are valuable and needed in a lot of farm work and agricultural work um, throughout all of North America, really, not just in the United States, but also these workers in Canada. So for example, here we see a Latin American migrant worker working on a tomato farm in Leamington, Ontario. And there are many impacts of migration. Again, these can be either positive or negative impacts. Uh, and they impact both the country receiving migrants and the country that migrants are leaving. So in terms of countries receiving migrants, those impacts could be positive. So for example, now you have more workers for your labor force. You have increased diversity, new viewpoints, and new cultures coming into your country. And it can also help negate a low birth rate. If your country's birth rate has dropped low, maybe not even enough to replace the people who are already alive. Let's say your birth rate drops below two, uh, two per family. Um, immigration can help bring that number up so that your country is no longer shrinking. On the other hand, um, immigration can have an impact on the country that's losing migrants. So these can be negative. So for example, the brain drain. Um, so it's the idea of you're losing skilled or knowledgeable workers from your economy who are leaving to go somewhere else. So an example of this would be that many Canadian actors and musicians, um, they aren't able to make a lot of money in Canada because the music and television industries are not as big in Canada. There's not as much money in it. So they might leave to go to Hollywood or to sign a record contract in the US. Um, and then Canada loses those people. In a lot of cases, these artists might take up US citizenship. On the other hand, it could also be positive impacts. So you might be getting rid of people who are politically or economically unwanted. Um, and an example of this might be Cuban migrants 
who for a long time could not legally enter the U.S., but who wanted to flee communist Cuba, they would get on those rafts and attempt to make it to Florida um, to seek asylum. And these are people who didn't want to be in Cuba. They were opposed to the communist government. So the communist government probably would not be very sad to see them go. And a final positive impact of, in, of losing people is the chance for remittances. Now, remittances are money that's sent by a person in a new country back to their old country. So let's say I move to a new country and I get a job there, but my family is still living in my old country. I might send some of that money back home to help my family out. And in some cases, this has a dramatic impact on the economies of these countries. Um, so, for example, Nepal, 32% um, of their GDP in 2015 was from remittances alone. That's a huge impact on their economy. So in summary, today you learned that human populations have been migrating for at least 100,000 years when our ancestors began to leave Africa. Net migration is the difference between immigration and emigration rate. Push factors encourage people to leave a place, while pull factors attract them to a new place. Migration can be either temporary or permanent, and both physical and political barriers can cause challenges to migrants.